If you know me and my content, you've no doubt seen or at least heard of my video going undercover as a cis man at my local NIFB church. For background info, the NIFB or New Independent Fundamental Baptist movement is a small assortment of evangelical churches that operate in loose autonomy. There's no central authority figure or church council. However, many consider Stephen Anderson the de facto leader of the movement, considering that he founded the NIFB in 2005. Anderson in the past has been banned from as many as 35 countries, although that list has been shortened over time and now consists of around six. He's been banned for what many call inflammatory hate speech towards queer people and anti-Semitic remarks. Since that original video of mine, I've kept tabs on the NIFB and a few months back, I did a stream looking at a controversy between several young church members who shared inappropriate jokes in a private chat and had been found out by their parents. The chat caused a controversy in the church for several jokes about beating women, racial slurs, sexual assault, and more. And after some of the texts were leaked, Steven Anderson was accused of attempting to cover up the scandal. On the stream where we discussed this controversy, we looked over leaked messages from the teens' chats and an additional article by Hemet Mehta, a journalist who keeps tabs on fundamentalist Christians, about one of the teens who was featured in the chat, Isaac Anderson, the son of NIFP founder Steven Anderson. Meta's article showed off a picture of Isaac brandishing a tattoo of a Reich Sadler, or Imperial Eagle, and several social media posts advocating Nazi beliefs. Knowing how hateful and angry his father could be, I felt it fair to assume at the time that Isaac had followed in his father's footsteps, although in a more drastic fashion. At least until Isaac himself left a comment on that video, which would begin a series of interactions culminating in the video you're watching right now. On my streams, I am more laid back and maybe a little bit too judgmental. I don't have the time to always balance entertainment with well thought out talking points, and it occasionally comes off as more petty or vicious than I would like. I think perhaps some people took that viciousness and advocation against Isaac's beliefs as an excuse to threaten Isaac and his family, including his wife. I want to be very clear, I have never advocated for any violent action or even threats to the subjects I cover, and if you take my content as an excuse to threaten anyone, especially family members of the subjects I cover, I do not want your support. I understand that for many people, the issues I cover are literally life and death. I also understand that around the topics and people I make content about, there will often be intense passion and anger. But I'm not interested in personal attacks and threats of violence as any means to build a community. And I'm a firm believer that the best way to build a movement and cement understanding between people who are different is to try earnestly to understand them. There are obvious issues that can and should be discussed about that group chat, but the things that were said are ultimately little more than tasteless messages between teenagers with no real life experience. They were said by kids who should have known better, but there was no evidence the horrible things said were based in anything aside from edgy kids trying to be edgy. I've since taken that video down because I don't feel I was fair to several people who were minors at the time, Isaac included. I feel that nobody should be judged solely by the sins of their fathers, and what people do as a teenager doesn't define who they are or who they need to be. In fact, I believe as a leftist, change and learning should be encouraged. That includes allowing people to learn from their mistakes and grow past them. Some of the best defenders of social justice have been pretty far right or even defenders of Nazism in the past, and we gain nothing by shutting out others' experiences. When I say experiences, I don't mean their politics, but their personal lives, what led them to their politics. Which is to say, in no way is this video me platforming a Nazi. I am interviewing someone who came to those beliefs after his time in the church. And it is that time that I want to focus on. I am nothing if not curious. When Isaac and I began chatting, I saw an opportunity to allow Isaac to tell his side of the story unabated, behind the texting controversy, but also what it's like to grow up under a man like Steven Anderson. Churches like the NIFB are closed off to the world for any number of reasons. To someone like me, they'd call a reprobate. They'd rather not speak to me at all for hate of my sin. This leads people to speculate about what it's like inside a church, what it's like to grow up in a fundamentalist household. And I saw chatting with Isaac as a way to get a first-hand account of what that's like. To my knowledge, Isaac still maintains his fascist beliefs, beliefs that I wholeheartedly disagree with and disavow. When we began to speak, I agreed to not focus the interview on politics because I wasn't looking for a political debate, just a illuminating documentary conversation 
on his personal experiences. Yet, beliefs don't happen in a vacuum. Everyone has a reason for doing the things they do and believing what they do. I can't speculate as to how Isaac's upbringing affected his views. I will leave that for viewers to decide what they wish. But I know that he has shown a remarkable amount of faith in trusting me to tell his story inside the church, at the very least. He doesn't seem to think I deserve to die simply for being a reprobate, like his father and other NIFB preachers would openly admit. I think the point of a good documentary is not to lead a viewer by a leash to a predetermined conclusion, but to give them the facts and allow them to decide for themselves. To that end, this interview will be almost entirely unedited, save for a few points to cut out interruptions. I am allowing Isaac's words to speak for him. Before we begin, however, I want to preface this interview with a warning. Most content around the hate church contains warnings for violence, derogatory language, and more. But in particular, I want to warn for some graphic descriptions of child abuse in the last half of the video. Living in a fundamentalist household isn't always easy, as Isaac Anderson described to me during a long hike in the American Southwest. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm Isaac Anderson. You already knew that. Uh, I'm Pastor Stephen Anderson's second oldest son. So, and I think he's the one who's the founder or leader or whatever of the new IFB, they call it. Um, and I mean, yeah, he started that in like, I think 2005, he started his church. So it's been a, it's been a while now, basically my entire life, really, I've been part of it. Since I was like two or three. Are you still in contact with uh, your father at all? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I still see him sometimes, from time to time, you know. Do you, so do you, because um, you had mentioned that you would kind of separated yourself a little bit from the church? Kind of. Uh, not so much, not so much the church is the problem. I don't like a lot of the church members. They're kind of just weird people. <laughs> it's not so much my parents as the people that they have in the church. Are, a lot of them are really weird. A lot of good people, but a lot of just kind of weirdos too. So I'm not a fan of that, but. And so you're, you are still practicing uh, your faith in the, the NIFB tradition, I guess. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely still a Christian, still a Baptist, still all that. Yeah. So what was it like, I guess, kind of growing up in that church with your father? Like, were you aware of the notoriety that your dad had? To a degree. I mean, cause he used to, he used to have like a hundred K subscribers on YouTube before they banned him. So like, I knew he was pretty well known. And sometimes if you went out with him in public, he'd get greeted by a fan. Like, I think I was in Aruba with him and like some random teenager came up to us on a street corner and knew who he was. I was real excited. So like he was, he had a decent amount of worldwide notoriety before he got a ban from like 38 countries. I think he's actually not banned for most of them now though. Cause he was given like a two year ban the Schengen zone, but that's expired now. He's banned from like five or six countries now. Okay. Like his, his bands, he got banned from most of Europe with the Schengen zone. I think the only ones he's still banned from are anything United Kingdom. He's like no Australia, no Ireland, no Great Britain. He's banned from South Africa, banned from Australia. Um, I think he's banned from Jamaica. I actually am banned from Jamaica too. Well, I don't know if I was banned from Jamaica. I was with him when he was going to Jamaica and he was banned. They didn't let me in either. So you would, you would join but, him on yeah. mission trips? A couple times, yeah. Kids will take turn. I went on a few of them with him. Uh, I've been to Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Aruba. Um, I think that's it as far as the international ones go, yeah. So I think he just took one of my sisters to St. Kitts recently. So is it for, kind so of like a scouting mission? Expected when you grow up in the church that you're going to become part of it someday or, or become a, a preacher as one of the, the men of the family? Oh, no, absolutely not. I don't know if you've ever heard any sermons. He has no interest in any of us becoming pastors as in he wouldn't care if we were not it's not pushed on us. so far none of my brothers have expressed an interest in it so but yeah they, he's not trying to put that on us at least he hasn't not not when i lived at home so i moved out in early 2021 and so growing up in the church like you were saying from a very young age the the yeah. church they like to talk a lot about and and especially uh your father and a lot of the other pastors about you know how bad modern media is how uh much degeneracy and stuff there is on tv and film what kind of stuff was available in the household for for the kids to watch i was gonna say is um you know maybe i probably shouldn't hike i might just sit here at the trailhead to talk just because uh, i don't want to lose service up here 
Okay. Right, let me just find a spot to sit so I don't risk losing my service. Um, what I was going to say is growing up, wasn't allowed to watch literally anything. Like I remember my brothers and I, we used to like, we'd get in big trouble for it, but we used to go on YouTube and like pirate the old Lego Ninjago episodes and stuff and stuff like that. Um, but we weren't allowed to like watch anything. Um, recently though, they're, it, the rules have greatly relaxed. They're allowed to watch like, obviously they're not allowed to watch like Deadpool or R rated movies, but they're allowed to watch like movies that I guess are appropriate for free teens and young and young kids. For example, like I went to my little brothers to see the Super Mario movie. Well, and so was that something that growing up as a kid, like, did you did you yeah. hang out with any other kids outside of the church very often? Um, we were allowed to, but the issue was growing up in my neighborhood, there weren't really any kids on our street. So it wasn't that we weren't allowed to hang out with other kids. It's just that besides church, there weren't a ton of other kids to hang out with. Because my parents had put us in some homeschool programs for like sports and fitness. But the homeschool kids were kind of weird and we didn't really like them. So it wasn't that we weren't allowed to. It was just that it just didn't really work out much. Um, I, I really started socializing a lot when I was 14 and started working. Started working since I was 14. And that's when I really started, you know, talking to people and stuff and meeting new people. Besides that, it was mostly church stuff, yeah, because we didn't like the homeschool kids, and there weren't a ton of kids our age on our street, at least not my age. So, so it's kind of just hanging out with your brothers and sisters and everything for the most part, growing up. Yeah, which I mean, there were a lot of us. I think it's it's up to twelve now total, but only the only nine live at home. The youngest nine still live at home. Um, and then there's my older brother, my younger brother. We were all moved out. So, and so, what's the kind of dynamic like? That growing up where you know every it seems like every other year every two years or so you'd be welcoming a new sibling yeah basically about every two years if you look at the ages like we're all almost exactly between like 18 and 24 months apart with very little variation um so yeah that's how it was and i don't know a ton about the modern because i moved out around this happened so growing up i don't know what you know it's my parents they had a uh, three bedroom, two bathroom house in Tempe. It was like, I forget if it was like 1,500 square feet or 2,000 square feet. Either way, it wasn't that big. Um, like at one point, I shared a room with four brothers. So we had five boys in one bedroom, and it wasn't like a huge bedroom or anything. So that was a little crazy. But now they have a much nicer home with a lot more bedrooms and bathrooms. They've uh, upgraded. So, but that was like right before I moved out. So I don't know. I don't know much about that. So I can only speak on like at least three, four years back when I still lived there. And were you kind of along with the other older kids and as the other kids got older, were you expected to help take care of and everything, the, all the other kids? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like we'd be doing, you know, laundry, cleaning, just chores and stuff. Or, you know, my mom would have a bunch of little kids in the car. So she'd have us run into the grocery store and pick it up rather than unloading all the little kids, stuff like that. Just general housework, because obviously if you have a household, which I think when I moved out, they I forget if they had 11 kids. I forget if it was 10 or 11. Either way, there were at least 12 to 13 people living in the house. So there's a decent amount of chores that need to get done for the maintenance of a 12, 13 person household. Well, and so you mentioned that you did have internet access as a kid. How was that kind of overlooked and overseen to, to make sure you guys so, didn't get into too much trouble? We were absolutely not allowed to have internet access. We did, but we weren't. We had all kinds of methods because we were always getting burner devices and stuff to you know use the internet. Problem was my parents would then just not tell us the Wi-Fi password. However, we had other ways around. I don't know if you like, you know, old routers have the WPS button. Yep. If you're at the router, you can push a physical button and it logs you in without needing a password. So we had workarounds like that because we we find like old cell phones my parents had discarded and they thought they were useless because, hey, there's no cellular and they don't know the Wi-Fi password. Of course, there's always workarounds and we were able to get in anyway. So frequently got caught and every time you know every time you get caught you just have to find a new better way to not get nailed next time yep i am i am very familiar with that my mom uh would take away cables and all sorts of stuff to make sure i wasn't playing video games yep. on school nights and yep, didn't I know think, that yep. the the computer that we had uh ran off the same cable so it wasn't i i was able to jerry rig that myself yeah, we at one point were trying to rig up an Ethernet thing, but we couldn't figure out how to connect to that. We weren't that clever. <laughs> we just had Wi-Fi password workarounds and device. I think at one point I had like four cell phones because I had like my personal phone, which had couldn't even watch YouTube on it. Then I had like a work phone. Then I had like multiple burner phones that I'd purchased or whatever, just used for with Wi-Fi. So I'd be using like my cellular phone that I was allowed to have, but everything on it was blocked, but I could create a hotspot and then use the burner to do everything that the other one couldn't. You mentioned uh, you had been working since about 14. Yeah. So is that like just regular like 
odd jobs, part-time jobs, like what nope. kind of stuff? Nope. I've been a plumber since I was 14. Just oh. been plumbing. I got hired by a plumbing company from the church. I was started out putting out flyers and stuff, just going door to door, leaving flyers on doors for the company. Then I started being like a helper, you know, riding along, doing stuff. And then when I was 16 and got a driver's license, they put me in a van and then I was just driving around doing plumbing. Uh, I've been doing that ever since. So yeah, I've just been a plumber for, that's the only line of work I've ever done, plumbing. Is there, was there ever any kind of push either towards or away from, you know, going to college or anything after homeschooling's finished? Uh, no, no. I believe actually some of my younger siblings are going to college. The reason I didn't go to college is because, uh, I didn't have any money to pay for it and I don't want a huge student loan debt. So that was the issue. They were not for or against it. It was more that they weren't going to be paying for it. So if I wanted to go to college, I'd have to be taking out my own student loan. And uh, I'm not interested in that. Okay. There's a chance if I – I've not ruled it out. I might go to college. But if I did, I'd probably do it abroad because, like, I can go to college anywhere in Germany if I want to and it wouldn't cost me anything. Or you pay, like – I'm sure – you pay a little bit for tuition and stuff, but it's practically free compared to the U.S. Because I don't know – I'm a dual national, so I can go there anytime I want. I can live there. I could I could get college there if I ever wanted to. I just haven't because so that, far plumbing's a plumbing's a good line of work. And that dual nationality, that's through your mom's side? Yeah, through my mom's side. So I've, I'm have i a full German citizen. That's why people keep telling me, oh, it's going to get banned from Germany. They're not allowed to ban me. They're not allowed to deny me entrance. I'm a full citizen by birth, and it cannot be revoked. I didn't like apply for that later. I've always been a citizen. So, yeah. Is your mom still running her blog, by the way? I don't know. I never read her blog anyway. Um, I don't. I don't know. I haven't been on it. Yeah, I have no, I have no idea. Was that? I think something... she does a lot of Instagram lives, and I think that's her current thing. But I don't know. Is is that something that because she was a, a stay at home mom, um, yep. just worked on taking care of the kids, keeping up the household. Was that like? Did she always kind of revolve through new things to keep her busy? Was the the blog kind of one of those things, and the the other kids just kind of regarded it like that? Yeah, did, I mean, she was she was always doing stuff. I think the blog. I'm not sure why she did it because, like, I don't think she there was any financial incentive in it for it. Wasn't a business thing. She just did it. I think purely just for educational reasons and to prove that large families work or something, and just to show how how she does things with a large family. But like, like from what I understand, there was no monetization and zero financial incentive for. Her. She wasn't like like an influencer or something. She got no money and she promoted no paid products. She just did it just just because. I guess since. Not not leaving the church, but since leaving your parents' household, yeah. how has your, I guess, consumption of media and stuff changed? Have you tried to catch up on TV shows or movies that you weren't allowed to watch or anything like that? I mean, yeah, obviously. Like, I've watched movies I've never seen. Like, for example, just last night, I saw The Truman Show for the first time. Great movie. Never saw it before. Uh, I just heard it was good and watched it. So I have done some catching up on that. I listen to music now, too. But since I never really listened to it much as a kid, I've never gotten super into it. Listen to audiobooks mostly at work. But I try to get into music. It's just not I don't like it much, unfortunately. So, um, you, but yeah, you, I've definitely caught up on that. You you weren't like you weren't allowed to listen to just like music and stuff as a kid outside of church. No, stuff? no. No, definitely not. Yeah, like even if it was a – it wasn't not just like, oh, we can't listen to rap music. No, we just weren't allowed to listen to any type of worldly music. From what I understand, those rules have relaxed and like my younger siblings are now. But when I lived there, absolutely not. It's zero music whatsoever. Besides like maybe classical, like I could probably listen to Beethoven if I felt like it. But nothing like modern music not or like 80s or anything. Any type of popular music was absolutely forbidden when, when I lived at home. Strictly. And that includes so. that includes like Christian faith music and all that stuff, like modern stuff. I don't know if I was allowed to listen to that. I wouldn't because that stuff sucks anyway. <laughs> but um, they didn't they didn't have to tell us not to listen to that. That that stuff's terrible. Like I was not exactly dying to listen to Lecrae or Hillsong or whatever garbage. I, every the faith based music, it's like garbage music. But then they just like put Jesus on it to try to like sell to Christians. But the music is objectively bad music. So just just say them them briefly mentioning Jesus does not somehow make their song enjoyable. So I never wanted to listen to that. I don't know if I would have been allowed to. I'm guessing not, but. Did you ever feel, I guess, because you mentioned that you didn't see uh, a whole lot of other kids until you started socializing kind of midway through being a teenager. Did you ever yep. feel growing up like isolated? Did you ever feel that the way you were treated, you know, wasn't fair that you didn't get to do things that other kids got to do? Not really, because I didn't know any better. It's not like I'd done it before and had it taken away. So it's like if you've never had something, you, you don't really miss it. And I and it's not like I sat alone all day because I had a bunch of siblings. 
Right. So it's not like I had zero human contact. I wasn't like I wasn't on an island somewhere by myself. So I had plenty of human contact. And as far as socializing with other kids, I'd basically seen the homeschool. We they put us in the homeschool groups because my parents were not trying to isolate us. They put us in the homeschool groups, and we just didn't like the homeschool kids because a lot of homeschoolers are really weird, um, like really weird. I don't know how much you know about that, but there's some real weird ones. So we didn't like that. So I just thought like, oh, I just don't really like hanging out with most kids because they're weirdos. So. Yeah. And then, of course, we'd be at somewhere and you see the public school group kids and they were like really stupid because kids in public school with with few exceptions are terribly uneducated because the school system here kind of stinks. It doesn't really care about anything. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I'd be, I'd be out like, say, at, like a museum or something and you'd see a public school group field trip. I'm hearing like the stupid questions they're asking the hosts, like really dumb, idiotic questions. And I'd be like, well, I don't really want to hang out with these. Then you hang out with the homeschool kids and they're just weird. So I just I just didn't like a lot of kids my age much at all, regardless of who I, of how I met them. So I didn't feel like left out because I didn't want to hang out with the public school kids or the homeschool kids, even if I could have. I just didn't want to. Were there a lot of other kids uh, in the church around your age? Uh, not when it first started. Probably like there were no kids at our age till I was like 13, 14-ish. Now there's a decent amount of teenagers in the church. But at the time, because obviously the church is smaller – and a small percentage of the church's population is going to be teenagers. Mostly the churches are small children. It's a lot of families with little kids. But if you're over the age of like 10 or 12, there weren't a lot for a while. These days, there's a decent amount. They've got some teenagers and young adults. But when I was there, because when you're like 13, you can't, you're, you don't really want to hang out with 9 and 10 year olds. But you also can't really hang out with like 25 year old adults either. So you're kind of at a weird in between position where you, where you can't really hang out with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, unless there's other kids your age. And there weren't a ton until I was 13 or 14. That's when they started coming in. Uh, what about hanging out with kids from other pastors or like during big NIFB events? Uh, oh, is that yeah. Thing? That, yeah. That was a blast. Yeah. Whenever like a pastor would come out with their kids or teenagers would be visiting. Yeah. You hang out. Those conferences were always great because you could you could meet a lot of young people because basically there's only there's a few teenagers at each church. But if they're all at the same conference, you can all hang out. That was pretty fun. And so we, we've kind of talked about uh your life at home and, and growing up yep. with so many kids, what, what was it like? Like how are birthdays celebrated? Are they, are they a big deal at all or because they happen so often? Not really. Do they group them all? Into no, one? I mean, I don't know how much other people do for birthdays. They, my parents did not do like massive, huge parties with stuff, but yeah, you'd have your birthday and you, you could bring some friends and stuff from church people. And yeah, it was, I mean, each kid got their own individual birthday. You know, you get a cake, you get gifts from your siblings, get a few gifts from your parents. At least that's how it was when I was there. It was pretty normal. Obviously, when my parents, when they had a bunch of kids at home, they didn't have a bunch of money to drop on each kid's birthday. Because when there's like 11 kids' birthdays, it's a birthday practically every month, sometimes multiple right, yeah. the same month. So we weren't all getting like thousands of dollars in gifts, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, no, each birthdays were definitely observed, though, yes. And usually part of your birthday, you know, you get stuff, and then basically you get to pick all three meals for that day, whatever you want. And then you were completely exempt from all chores and stuff. So it was kind of just like a cool day off. You get to eat whatever you want. You get some gifts. Usually you get to pick a birthday trip somewhere too. So say you want to go, I want to go to the aquarium. Or I want to go to the amusement park or, or the fair if it's that time of year. Something like that. Now, how how present was your kind of father in your day-to-day -day upbringing? He was there, but also kind of not there because he was often doing a lot of computer work. He was He would usually be in the house. Uh, but he would often be working on his computer or something. So he 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 was around, but he wasn't like super available all the time because he has a lot of work with his computers and stuff. Or he's always learning a new language and stuff, or or getting a new college degree. He's doing he's always doing stuff like that. So speaking of your father, let's talk a little bit about kind of discipline. Your father and a lot of other uh, NIFB pastors are very open about corporal punishment for correction. Oh yes, definitely. So what what's kind of your experience with that? Uh, it was as advertised. Yeah, he 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 was as good as his word on that. No, they were very into corporal punishment. Which, to be fair, obviously no kid likes getting spanked. I seen what parents who raise, don't spank their kids look like, and I'm still for spanking. When I have a kid, my kid is absolutely getting spanked. Uh, I don't think it works just because little kids are kind of stupid. Uh, they're not old enough to understand. You can't reason with a three year old why they shouldn't touch outlets or hot stoves there's not much you can do besides smack their hand they don't understand about electrical shocks being dangerous to you or touching hot things it's just you slap their hand when obviously if your kid's a teenager you can reason with them more and rather than just do as they say or i'll beat you then they're old enough to be reasoned with when you have a small child there is no reasoning with them have, have you i don't know if you ever try to argue with a four-year-old about something it doesn't work like they simply lack the brain power to be argued and reasoned with 
So they kind of only respond to a very primitive, just if you do this, I do that. Um, and then once they're older, you can actually explain the rules. So obviously any rule you have for a four-year-old is a thing. It's brush your teeth because they don't understand about tooth decay and plaque. But it's brush your teeth or I'm going to hit you. Then by the time you're a teenager, you understand I brush my teeth because I want my teeth to be healthy and clean. And you don't have to be forced to do these type of things. So, yeah. But for small children, corporal punishment, to my knowledge, is the only way that actually works. But – they definitely did did plenty of that though. And are you okay talking so, yeah. about the 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 texting scandal in the church? Oh, absolutely. I'll talk all about that. I mean, there's plenty of information on it. Um, they had. I'm surprised they didn't get more screenshots because that was like the tiniest fraction of our chats. Um, which is those screenshots are nothing. We had that chat going for like six months or something, and it was like practically a 24 seven chat. That's what was cool about it because somebody was always on. Even in the middle of the night, just talking, texting. What it was is they don't have a lot of them because the people that were screenshotting were only on it for a little bit of the time. It was this one kid and his family. So they weren't on it all the time. So most of the, I guess you could say the worst stuff happened. We were texting at night and no one was on to see that. Because um, then we, we were always deleting the chat and starting it like new every day. Like deleting all existing messages so that some bum couldn't screenshot it. Like exactly what happened. But And who was all in the chat, if you remember? Oh, I don't even know, dude. There were there were, there were some people. They're the main ones. Obviously, it was me tied into the chat. My brother Solomon had no involvement. He was put on like once for like 10 minutes, but he didn't want to be part of it just because he just wasn't trying to. It wasn't that he condemned what we were saying. It's just he just didn't want to be part of the chat. So he was on there like temporarily, but it was mostly me and a few other church kids. And so, and how, so yeah. how did your parents find out about uh, this chat? Um, so I want to say it was the family. They had their kid in there, which I said, uh, what is it that he shouldn't be allowed on the chat because he was a loser and was going to snitch on us. And I knew this. And of course he did him and his mom, I think just took a bunch of screenshots and they had, they started some parents and just sent it to the parents of everybody involved. So that's how my parents found out. Someone just screenshotted it and just sent our screenshots, which was kind of lame, but did that cause any controversy in the church? Yeah, absolutely. My dad lost like literally dozens of church members over this because these people, that's what I was saying about the church members. They're such prudes. They they apparently thought that teenage boys on a group chat would not make a couple of dirty or slightly racist jokes. They were just horrified. Like there was this one talking about, oh, I've been in construction for 13, since I was 13 years old and never in my life have I heard such foul, filthy talk. Or, which he's a liar. He's ne- And he's clearly never been on a job site. Like the, the, the prudes at the church were just horrified that teenagers made dirty jokes or something or were slightly racist on a group chat. Like as if that's not like what every teenage boy does. And did you see any, you know, corporal punishment or reprimanding for, for being in the chat? Yeah, I physically received it. Um, as far as I know, the other children involved, or yeah, children got nailed too. Um, they got they they got it. I definitely got it. Uh, Had Solomon already moved out by this point? Nope, Solomon still lived at home. Solomon moved out a couple weeks after I did. I moved out right after my birthday in February um, of 2021. Solomon moved out a few weeks after I did. What kind or 19 of now, I believe actually prompted you moving out so quickly after your birthday? Uh, cause I was planning on moving out as soon as I turned 18 because it okay. sucked living at home. It was, I turned 18. That's what prompted it. <laughs> and then I think Solomon kind of just followed my lead and moved out right after me. Was your father like during the, going back to the texting scandal real quick, how yeah. did your father, I guess, regard the well being of the other teenagers affected? Or was that something that he mentioned to you at all? Um, he definitely was not a big fan of the people trying to make it a big witch hunt because people are accusing my dad of trying to like cover this up. He did not try to cover anything up. He preached about it from a pulpit. He just did a live stream the service because here's my dad's perspective. With the exception of one person, everybody on this chat was a minor. Everybody, myself included. People keep saying I was 18. Running. I was not. I was a minor. At the time. Everybody was a minor except for Josh Thompson. Josh Thompson, I think, was 18 at the time. Everybody else was – he was freshly 18. Everyone else was a minor. So my dad was trying to say we do not need to put this as a permanent public record as minor teenagers had a re- idiotic group chat where they said stupid stuff. We don't need to put that on them permanently. He, he was like, oh, he tried to cover it up. He didn't cover anything up. He publicly addressed it. From, um, in a, He had an entire sermon basically dealing with it. It wasn't live streamed, obviously, for obvious reasons. He did not want to permanently affect – any children's lives because they were all kids we're talking about everybody was a child or all teenagers but all kids too and uh was josh thompson the the 
non-minor in that chat? Josh was. I believe he was 18 at the time. Yeah, Josh is a little bit older than me. I think I was the second oldest person on there. And was there, I'm, I may be misremembering, uh, but was there some kind of controversy with Solomon a couple years ago as well? I mean, he had an engagement that broke off with a girl. Well, that's hardly controversial that not all relationships work out. Uh, people on the internet were talking all about it, but he basically just had an engagement. Things didn't work out, and that's it. Solomon is now married. Um, he just got married like a week and a half ago. But yeah, this was years ago. I think this is when Solomon, this was not a couple years ago. This was like, dang, probably at least four or five years ago. Because I think Solomon is, no, Solomon's turning 22 this year. Yeah. He's, or is he? No, he's turning, hang on. Let me do some quick math. No, Solomon, Solomon is 22. He's turning 23 this year. My bad. He's turning 23 this year. This was when he was not even 18 yet. He was 17 when his engagement got broke off. So yeah, we're talking literally like five years ago. He just had an engagement that got broken off. Not really much else to say about it. Do you or any of the family, because obviously your your father knows and has preached about the the people who will uh, call him hateful or call him a bigot or whatever. Yep. Do you or any of your family keep tabs on or were you aware of the kind of the, the communities that keep tabs on fundamentalist Christians like you guys? My parents don't. They don't care. They say they don't. They, I personally absolutely love reading about myself on Reddit, and I learn stuff about myself I didn't know. They're talking about that Isaac did this. I was like, I did what? And it's hilarious because it's so not true, but it's the funniest thing ever reading them, like speculating and stuff. Like when Salma just got married, they're like, yeah, Isaac was banned from the wedding, and I heard him and his band. I was I was the best man at the wedding, so I'm not sure how I got banned. But it's hilarious reading about, like, yeah, the wedding, Isaac was totally forbidden from showing up, and – Obviously, that kind of stuff's hilarious, but I love reading it. My parents don't because it's just negativity. I I find it hilarious, but they don't. Like I love reading about the 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 people talking about our screenshot chats or whatever. That stuff's so funny to me. They're just horrified that teenage boys do not uh, speak respectfully on group chats. Do you feel that like kind of growing up in the church, and or, or I guess how do you feel? growing up in the church and hearing your father's preaching has affected your kind of worldview as an adult? I don't know, to be honest, because I'd never, as I said, I never knew anything else. I'm sure my being raised the way I did by my parents would have, um, what is it, definitely affected me, obviously. Um, I've definitely also, as an adult, made my own observations and come to my own conclusions, some of which agree with theirs. And I go, yeah, they were right. Others, I say, I think they weren't right about. It's kind of just, yeah, it, it just goes back and forth. What are kind of some of those things that you think they weren't right about? Um, I think they were a little too strict on certain things, like that the Bible doesn't even talk about. Like, for example, the all the pants on women stuff. I think that's a misappropriation, and they're just – I understand if they're okay with saying women should wear skirts, men should wear pants, but they shouldn't say it's a sin for women to wear pants. I disagree with that because um, the Bible does not state what is a man's garment or a woman's garment. I think that's left up to culturally. For example, if I'm wearing a pair of men's pants, it's very obvious. If I put on a pair of women's pants, it's not the same thing. It's an extremely clear difference. Just like if a woman is wearing a pair of men's jeans, it's, it's, it's quite obvious whether she's wearing women's jeans, it's obvious what she's wearing. So I think that's what that thing is referring to, not just exactly pants or skirts. Otherwise, why didn't the Bible say so? It kind of leaves that open. It just says women's clothing and men's clothing. It doesn't say doesn't say any like criteria of what is what so and what are some of the things that like just going about your day-to-day -day life and you know whatever political beliefs whatever other day-to-day -day things you encounter what are things that you kind of go back and think about the church and your upbringing or even if you do i mean uh, yeah those. i think my dad my dad in the church they were really into like libertarianism i thought libertarianism was cool till i was like 12 and realized libertarianism is like the dumbest idea possible it's basically just diet anarchy which is so stupid it can't work it will never work it never has worked like oh yeah what if we just have no everyone just gets to do whatever they want i think people will find out quickly that uh yeah that might work for them there's a there's too many bad people out there you can't let it can't be some free-for-all libertarianism and anarchy are both just idiotic and don't work which is why no one does them but that that's a big thing at the church they're all libertarians and i think that's stupid but well, and going into, I guess, kind of bouncing off of that, talking about your father and uh, libertarianism, yep. were there ever, like, like, where did your father get news from or where did he get information from growing up? Or were you privy to that at all? 
I don't know. We never watched cable television. I, to this day, still don't have cable television because cable television is exclusively filled with just brain-rotting content. It's either news, which depending on if you watch or Fox or CNN, you're just getting the same lies with a slightly different spin, which is to my knowledge, all the cable news companies are complete liars. Like you watch, you go you turn on Fox and they got that Jesse Waters crying about Biden uses a straw to drink his milkshake and how unmasculine it is because he uses a straw. And I'm like, I'm, I drink a straw, dude, and I'm way bigger and stronger than that queer Jesse Waters. But um, and then you go on CNN and it's the same crap, just equally stupid. But this time they're like picking fun of Republicans for just fake made up issues. So I don't watch cable news. My parents never watched cable news. And of course, everything else on cable TV sucks, too. What are you going to watch Ancient Aliens or something on the History Channel and just lose some brain cells? So, well, because yeah. I know you're, I don't you're... know where my dad got his news. Not not cable. We never had cable. I don't have cable. He probably just I don't know. Well, because I know he's been on, um, I think it was a couple months back, he was he joined, uh, it wasn't Alex Jones, but it was another host on InfoWars. Yeah. Uh, were, you, were you aware of that at all? I'm aware of InfoWars. Uh, my dad went on InfoWars. To my knowledge, he didn't watch a lot of InfoWars because Alex Jones is a deranged nutcase, and my dad knows that. Alex Jones is a complete lunatic. My dad was just on his show, I think, for the platform. He is not an Alex Jones supporter, and Alex Jones is a complete moron. <laughs> But my dad has been on his show and with some of his people. Did Were there ever any kind of like political or religious texts that he would read or was it pretty much just like the Bible? Oh, no, no. He definitely – he's read a bunch of things. I mean he's read like the Bhagavad Gita, the the Quran, the Book of Mormon. He reads an extensive amount of religious texts from all religions as well as – he reads plenty of political books too. Yeah, no. He does not just read the Bible. And I might add too, growing up, we were allowed to read – Basically, any book that wasn't like smut or something, I was allowed to read not fiction, non fiction, reading. So that's why, too, I never really not noticed not much having TV growing up. I've been an avid reader my entire life and still am to this day, just read so many books. So, because we have one of the biggest children's libraries in the country in Tempe, Arizona, we have like one of the biggest and best ones. Um, and yeah, I basically read tons of stuff there. And my dad read a lot of books as well. Well, and really, really quick talking about because you you mentioned how um, your dad and the church, they they will kind of condemn yeah. like women wearing pants and stuff like that. And I've noticed in some other uh, sermons and videos is there seems to be a very fine line of things that your father in particular will label as queer uh, or as not fitting oh, for men. Everything gay. So is that are, are those... I disagree with that crap. Okay, so those are things that you also like just disagree with and yeah. even growing so, up you were kind of like Yeah, so I'm a straight married man. Um I'm not going to be told that if my shorts fall a couple inches above my knee, I'm a homosexual for that like, "Oh wow, I'm a homo now, really." Or if I wore a pink tie or a pink shirt, I'm now suddenly a queer for that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's 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 moronic really to say that like, "Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a straight married man, but oh dear, what's this? My shorts don't touch my knees. I'm a homosexual now." I guess just because some weird weirdo at the church said I am, or if well, you're, or or if you put any effort into your hair or appearance, like if you use lotion, oh yeah, you're a queer. You use lotion. So is that something that kind of growing up and and seeing your father preach from the pulpit, do those kind of things affect how you see like gay people and queer people? No, no, because a lot of this. I mean, obviously, most gay people you you can spot a lot of them. I'm sure you know this. Others you can't. It really just depends. Because some of them, it's it's exceedingly obvious, you know, with like the like the walk, the speaking cadence, things, body body language, but a lot of them look, I guess you'd say, normal, as in you can't at a glance distinguish them. I really don't care. I don't see a lot of gay people in public, really, or at least I'm not noticing them if they're out there. So it's not really a, I'm not that like obsessed with trying to spot in public or whatever. Like I'm just, I just go out in public and I sometimes see them. Sorry, I didn't mean to drop a slur. I don't, I don't want to get you banned on YouTube. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I can I can censor it. Um, yeah, my bad. So, um, <laughs> well, and on that note, I guess, have did you ever notice or, or during church services, like were there ever protesters out front or anything like that? Yeah, but they'd be like five. They had like the lamest protests ever because people don't. It's Arizona. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of people with the character to stand in, in the sun holding a sign that no one cares about when it's 100 degrees outside. It sort of makes protesting not fun. And they can't come on the property. Like, they can't do anything. They had to literally stand on, like, the city's sidewalk, which is, like, 100 feet. They couldn't go anywhere in the parking lot or anywhere on the property because it's private property, the whole thing. 
So they had to stand on the public sidewalks. They're like 200 feet away from the church holding a sign in the heat and no one cares. And they just got ignored. So because of that, yeah, it wasn't, a, it, it was, no one cared. Well, and kind of just going off of the, the controversial nature of a lot of the, not just Stephen, but a lot of the other pastors, how, like, were you, you aware when other controversies would break out at other churches, like when uh, Bruce Mejia's oh, yeah. church was bombed, was that were those like big things across all the congregations? Bruce Mejia got bombed. Since when did Bruce Mejia get or bombed? I never heard about or... this. It was. It was. One I didn't of know the... any of them got bombed. That's that's interesting. That's because okay. Bruce Mejia lives in like his church. I've been there. It's in like a real sketchy part of L.A. I think he's in like a higher crime area. So I'm not. I guess I'm not super surprised he got bombed. I, I, I might have to, to double check. I'm I'm pretty sure it, it was it was Bruce. It was one of them that uh yeah there was there was some kind of explosive. Regardless, device. I had no idea. I had no idea any of them got bombed. I don't follow. I don't follow a lot of the other passes because I'm not a fan of most of them. I think they're like kind of stupid. Um, but I don't follow them, so I don't follow that stuff. What what makes you say you that some bombed, of them are that's stupid? Have you ever listened to them talk extensively? They yeah. half of them. Half of them can't even talk properly string together a sentence. They're a bunch of just like fat mouth breathers. Like my dad and a couple of the others are the only ones who can actually like speak, regardless of how you disagree with their ideologies. They can actually articulate a sentence properly, whereas a lot of their other guys are just objectively bad speakers. Even if what they're saying is true, I don't want to listen to their crappy preaching because they're bad at, at delivering a sermon. And that's kind of just so I don't follow any of them. As your dad, because I know your dad kind of started this whole NIFB movement, and a lot of people have talked about, you know, how he's not he's not in charge of everything. He's not a, a cult leader. That's something that's often thrown around a lot. Um, yeah, he's does, definitely not like a pope or a leader. No. Does Does he have any real say in when people, you know, are, are given leadership of a new church? Only if he's sending them out. Obviously, he sent out pastors from Faithful Word. Anybody else, he has no say. He does not call these pastors and tell them what to do. It's like I lived with him. At least he didn't when I lived there. He doesn't tell these guys what to do. They do their own thing. It's basically just – and most of them were not sent out by him either. It's basically just like-minded pastors. They collaborate on conferences and events. But besides that, there's no centralized leadership because that's part of the whole independent Baptist. It's not Southern Baptist where there's like a convention. It's the whole independent fundamental Baptist. So each church is totally freestanding and does their own thing, and they just collaborate on certain things and get along. But there's no centralized leadership. No one's in charge. My dad is obviously just a respected member. So if he has an opinion on something, people are probably likely to listen to it, but he's not in charge. And like if a pastor disagrees with them, they're not getting kicked out of the movement. And and just to, to keep talking a little bit about controversy, if you're okay with that for a minute. Um, sure, let's do it. Going back to the, the kind of the funny snark boards and the Reddit boards and people talking about you, I came across one story and I have no oh, like, way to... Okay verify it's authenticity. Fact check it. yeah exactly uh about your mom saying something to the effect of she wouldn't want any of her daughters marrying a black person oh absolutely that is absolutely true black mexican they're not marrying any of those neither the sons either for that matter that is abs i didn't see that on reddit but that is absolutely true at least when i went there they didn't say it quite so nicely but yeah they said that absolutely uh is that is that something that's that's preached in church or just more no so my dad from the pulpit preaches he's totally fine with interracial stuff he doesn't care doesn't care he just doesn't want it for his kids um which whatever man um that's their thing they absolutely said that though i'm sure they're gonna they may or may not deny saying that but they said that both of them on many occasions is that so yeah. that's something um, that you would you would hear in like the household oh absolutely yeah any uh any speculation as to why they don't like them. Um, I mean, my dad's, I don't know if you know, my dad said the N word from the pulpit once. I don't know if you're aware of that. I am not. He dropped an N bomb. Well, he, he, to be fair, he wasn't saying it. He was reading off, it was a sermon he made about Kanye West and he read off some Kanye West lyrics that included the N word and he just read it off. Um, obviously, he doesn't normally preach the N word because he doesn't, he doesn't talk a lot of, a lot of racist stuff from the pulpit. Not that I can remember at least. So, no, they just basically don't want their daughters. I think what it is is most people, they want their kids and grandkids to look like them to a degree. And it's not that he has any dislike for black people because the church is quite racially diverse. Tons of Mexicans, Asians, black people, tons of diversity, honestly. Like it's a lot. It's not like there's just one token black family. There's tons of black church members, tons of Asians, a lot of Latinos. So we have all kinds of people in, in the church. Do you ever remember any 
I guess, controversies from other church members or, or people bringing stuff up, having issues with stuff your dad would say from the pulpit? Not not that I can remember. I don't remember anything like that of, of anything, like anybody super disagreeing. Because most of the stuff he preaches, someone disagreed with, they just uh, didn't. They just didn't say anything. Or if it was so bad, they just quit the church over it because they hated it so much. But for the most part, no, I don't I don't know of any of that. OK, Um how was your father's kind of notoriety treated around the household? Like, was it was it known to everybody how or yeah. like why he was hated and how he was hated? Of course, of course, we knew, we knew. And were those things just like, were, was that used as a, a lesson to tell you about how you know worldly everybody else was and uh, how the world hates you know people who are who are out there preaching? I don't remember. Um, they kind of just like, yeah, they hate us, whatever. It was just, I mean, anybody who has, who's as loud and opinionated as my father is with his beliefs, they're going to have haters, whether you're right wing or left wing. If anyone who has a platform that large preaching very polarizing topics, whether it's extreme left or extreme right wing, you're going to have a ton of haters just because when you're that polarizing with that large of an audience. So yeah, it was nonstop death threats and hate mail to the church and stuff. So that's been around my entire life. Yeah. And how would you say, I guess, dealing with some of the other, because your your father is vehemently against gay people of any stripe, uh, to the point of, like we were saying, saying, anything LGBT. Yeah, if you're anything but straight man or straight woman, absolutely not. Yeah, uh, they got they... tolerance. And has spoken at least not not necessarily explicitly racist, but you know, saying that he doesn't want his kids to intermarry or to have any mixed race kids or grandkids. Yeah, basically. Yep. He and wants his kids to look like him. I mean, that's that's basically every white parent for the most part. If they're if they're honest, I'm sure a lot of them say otherwise, but most white people, if they're honest about it, want grandkids that are not half black. And even a lot of black people like are like that. They don't want their kids marrying a white person. It's just I think that's just a you can argue about whether or not you think that's right, but that's human nature on that front to want your kids to look like you. Well, and I guess or grandkids, on, I should say. On that note. Would you be able to speak to any perceived because your your father has also and I, I know Aaron Thompson has has taken similar approaches and talked about Aaron how they're Thompson not... is a complete <laughs> that guy's a moron. I hate that guy. He's a complete loser. <laughs> Do you have any uh, specific experiences with him that would make you? Yeah, say he's that? a fat mouth breathing slob. He's a complete idiot. I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin with that guy. He's a complete just tool bag. I absolutely don't. I I always hate when they put like the more normal ones with that guy because that guy's a complete just idiot. I don't even want to hear about like like you can't even put him in the same thing. I don't. What sort of what racist stuff has he said? Because I don't. To my knowledge, my dad doesn't say anything racist from the pulpit. And I mean, even the stuff in his personal life, it's not even racist because he's not saying black people are worse than white people or something. And he's even pro interracial marriage. He has nothing against it. He just doesn't want his kids doing it because it's his personal preference. That's it. Well, Aaron Thompson, he he takes a similar approach when talking about particularly the Jews. Uh, oh and... yeah, I think you called Aaron Thompson a Nazi, or someone did. Aaron Thompson is not a Nazi. He just hates Jews. If you go, if you look through Christian history, Christians have hated Jews like for like at least the last thousand years. Like read what Martin Luther had to say about the Jewish people. That's long for Aaron Thompson is not a Nazi by any means. He just hates Jews because G- Nazis did not invent hating Jewish people. A lot of people hated them bef- long before that. So none of them, to my knowledge, are even remotely Nazi or even espouse Nazism in the slightest. They just hate Jews. So yeah. And so is that in your in your experience, because the thing that Aaron Thompson will delineate is he'll say, you know, that he doesn't hate Jewish people or people from Israel. He hates the religion. Is that is that true or is it it seems like I believe it's that is true blended. to an extent. No, they I, I they're, they're not interested in someone is distantly ethnically Jewish. I mean, they're more interested in are they a practicing member of Judaism? That is correct. To my knowledge, that's their perspective. They're not interested on like. If a DNA test says they're Jewish, they're interested in what they actually believe. So it's technically not a racial thing. It's more of an ideology-based thing. And so obviously, I, if a Jew is not a practicing Jew, you'd never really notice that they're a Jew. Because besides that, they, they just look like white people. Like, they don't, they don't look really any different. Like, for all I know, you, you could be Jewish, and you might not know. If you get a DNA test, you might be. But unless they're practicing, they're kind of hard to spot. So I guess... Those those teachings around, you know, the synagogue of Satan um, and yep, yep. The, the Talmud all and all that stuff. All that. Yeah. Do you feel that those in any way influenced your personal beliefs? 
Uh, I don't know. I, to a degree, maybe. I mean, I, I didn't care much about it. I didn't talk. I didn't think much about it. Because I don't really deal with Jews on a daily basis or something. <laughs> oh, it really wasn't a big part of my life. Um, my dad preached against it. But he preaches against Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormons, Islam. He preaches against any religion that he doesn't agree with, as well as branches of Christianity like Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and stuff like that. So he goes after any religion. They weren't going after Jews because they were going after because they're Jews. They were going after them because it's a different religion than Christianity. So that's the real reason, I think. And do you see that kind of reaction? Because the the thing that strikes me most about the the NIFB compared to the IFB is how yeah. reactive they are towards like pretty much anything worldly, like different different religions, different beliefs of any kind. Is that something that like you, you mentioned that your dad has loosened up some restrictions in the home? Do you think that he's loosened up on some of those or no? On his. But it's not that they're saying other religions should be illegal. They're just saying they're wrong, and they just want people to know that because they're hoping to convert members of those religions. They're hoping to, say, convert a, a Catholic or a Muslim or something like that. They're not saying we're preaching against Islam because Islam should be outlawed and illegal. They're preaching against it because it's a false religion, and they just want people to come to the to Christianity instead. So right. if they're preaching against Judaism, they're not they're not saying round these Jews up and put them in camps. They've never called for that. They're literally – and if you watch the sermons, they would say we should even get them saved give them the gospel of jesus and that's it like when they're anti-jew they're not saying gas them or something or anything or anything like that absolutely not at least never that i've heard i can't vouch because some of these guys are real weird and they absolutely might have said that but i've never heard it and i at least know that's what my dad doesn't say so and and that's that's actually an interesting point you were you were talking about uh you don't know what everybody has said which you know there's no way there's how many there's, there's too many don't even follow because i yeah. can yeah, this always cracks me up. I'll catch a video on the internet of some pastor saying something and it sounds like, that's nuts. And then I like look it up and I was like, oh, wait, that's literally one of the NIFB guys. I don't follow a lot of them because they're kind of weird saying some interesting, they have some interesting ideas like that. You've talked about how, and your father, they, they are open about wanting to convert and wanting to, you know, get people living the Christian lifestyle, living in the word and the faith. Something like that, yeah. Where does that line draw for reprobates i guess they're not interested in trying to convert them they believe they cannot be converted they do not try they simply don't so if you're a queer they're not interested in trying to convert you and do you Which, do you believe that as to well? my knowledge to my knowledge not a lot of queers have been interested in my dad's convert uh church and conversion so as far as they're concerned, they might even be right because no one else has been interested in converting um, none of their reprobates have been interested so is that something that, that you still believe, too? I have put no thought into that matter. It doesn't matter because there aren't a whole lot of homosexuals lining up to join my father's church. So whether or not they want to join and are not allowed to is irrelevant because so far none of them have tried. So it's kind of like I don't even know. I don't, I don't put much thought into that. As I said, I don't see a lot of queers in public. They don't really affect my life. I think we have a lot bigger problems than some tiny percentage of the population doing something that I may or may not approve of because it's the Bible. Uh, I don't care. Now I'm proud. They're probably going to call me a soy boy liberal for that, but I just don't care. It does not affect my life. We we have a lot bigger things to worry about than whether or not there are trans people or kids or who gives a shit, man. <laughs> it it doesn't affect my life enough for me to care. I'll start caring once it starts affecting me. And really quick, I do want to circle back around to um, just some of the the relationship with your dad and yep. the, the texting scandal and all that stuff. When you yep. You mentioned that you kind of got yours. Was uh, that was that was physical? You got a, a physical beating. Oh, absolutely, definitely. And you know the the things that you guys were talking about were those did did getting caught or getting uh, you know reprimanded by your father did that inspire any like oh gosh I really shouldn't do this or did you did you you know pray for forgiveness and that kind of thing. No, I was just mad that they didn't listen to me and kick out the kid that I said was going to snitch, and he absolutely snitched, and I said he was going to, and I said he's going to get us all in trouble. Uh, that was the only takeaway for me. I do not regret anything I said. I was Most of it was just joking. Like People like, oh, these are our serious opinions. Most of it was completely facetious. We were just joking around. So in that case, how do you regret making a joke? Because you didn't mean it. It's not like we said something that we truly believed and have changed our minds. Most of the bad screenshots are not our true beliefs whatsoever. We're teenagers. We're just joking around, saying awful things. That's what happens if you put a bunch of teenage boys on a group chat. 
Um, it's like any video game lobby or something. So we didn't we we didn't actually mean any of the stuff we were saying. At least any of the bad stuff they had screenshots of. Well, and because and, of that, yeah, it was it was dumb. And you 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 know you definitely have a point there. Is that I I find it hard to hold most things against teenagers, especially ones who are telling obviously edgy jokes in in a a space right, that right. they I think, think they is were safe. talking about us like yeah we were talking about hiring hookers and beating them they're like they were actually gonna no we were joking it was a joke now you might have all you want to say about it's a bad joke it's wrong it's misogynistic it's bigoted but at the end of the day it's just a joke and they were trying to claim that we seriously meant those things and that was the issue so I didn't learn much from it. No, I really didn't because I didn't mean it's not like I meant it's not like I actually thought beating women was acceptable or OK. And then and now I've learned my lesson. I never thought beating women was OK. I still think it's not OK. Never have beat a woman. Never would. I mean, not unless I was like in, in serious danger, but that hasn't happened yet. Well, and and we can we can cut this part out if you want. But sure. is your wife one of the people who was in that group chat? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She was one of the she was one of the girls in the group chat. Yeah. Uh, she was one of them. We're now married. We've been together for it'll be four years this like April or May. So we actually met through that group chat. So it was a group chat of a bunch of church kids, basically. And that's where I first started talking to was on that group chat. That's also part of the I don't regret being part of that chat because that's literally where I met my wife. So, yeah, I'm not terribly regretful of anything I did there. I'm only sorry I got caught, basically. Yeah. And I guess how to my knowledge, that was all the kids. Josh Thompson was sorry he got caught too. John was pretty sorry he got caught. None of us were sorry for anything we, we did. Absolutely not. Well, uh, yeah, that's that feels like how it is sometimes when you're a teenager. Um well also because it's not like we truly held these awful beliefs. Because if we truly right. believed the things we were saying, that would be quite reprehensible. But we didn't actually believe it. So what? We're just we made a joke we shouldn't have. And to us beating women were like that's we would never do this that's why we can joke about it so so was there any perhaps it wasn't prudent in your in your kind of limited uh yeah internet access and stuff was there any exposure to you know edgy jokes that teenagers make edgy like 4chan and reddit boards and stuff that you guys would go um on? i never have been on 4chan in my entire life i didn't visit reddit till i was an adult so no I think the edginess, it was pretty original in a sense. Like we didn't learn these jokes on like weird forums or message boards. I wasn't playing video games. I didn't have video game lobbies. I think it was just teenage boys just naturally joke about horrible fucked up things uh, just naturally. Like I didn't need someone to influence me to do that because my parents were really trying to feel like, where did you learn to make these jokes? I was like, I didn't. You, you just you just come up with it on your own. So, yeah, we we weren't influenced to do that. We just did it anyway. Did you, you know, resent your father's uh, corporal punishment at all? Oh, I definitely didn't like it. In hindsight, I deserved it for a lot of things, but not for the group chat stuff. Also, when you're dealing with teenagers, I think physical violence is not the answer. Because if you if you have a 16-year-old and the only way you can get through them is through a physical beating, you have failed to raise them properly. By that age, they should be old enough to be reasoned with. And I'm not saying don't have consequences for them, but hitting kids is for like small children. I'm not saying hit like beat them or something, you know, slap their hand away for if they try to touch an outlet. You, you just kind of smack their hand or something. But when you have an older teenager that you can talk to and reason with, you shouldn't just have to do as I say, or I'll beat the crap out of you at that point. If, if, if your child is that much of a delinquent, you failed a long time ago, but the only way to control a 16 year old is through physical violence. So it's safe to say you disagree with some of your father's parenting methods. Oh, absolutely. Some of them are right. Some of them are not. And as I'm an adult, I don't have kids yet, but so who knows? My viewpoints might change even further. Once I do have a child, who knows? And you, you mentioned that you are married. Uh, are you planning to kind of go into building a family the same way that the church uh, preaches about? No. Um, I mean, I'm definitely going to have kids. I'm not going to have unlimited kids because they, they teach if you do use any form of any method whatsoever that would prevent you from having as many children as is humanly possible, thinner, thinner absolutely wrong total sin so like obviously i understand anti-abortion i'm anti-abortion personally um but like they think say any type of contraception whether it's a condom even if it's cycle tracking where you just avoid certain fertile nights all sin all complete damnable sin or whatever all of it i don't i disagree with that quite strongly and was there to to kind of piggyback off of that was there ever any you know sex education in in the homeschooling environment no no not really uh 
No. So what was it like? And then you don't have to go into this if you want, but I guess what was it like, you know, having very, very limited internet access, getting up to stuff teenage boys get up to on the internet? Yep. Was that something that like you you shared with your brothers at all? Like, hey, here's here's how you can get to this website on the internet or anything like that? Never, never. Um, I never watched like pornography growing up. I don't know if my brothers did. If they did, I didn't know about it. We didn't do that. That that just wasn't a thing for us. Now, obviously, I obviously you, you end up you we end up being exposed to some on some level, but we 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 never sought it out or anything. Okay. At least not to my knowledge. I never told them that wasn't something that we talked about, no. All right. Um, yeah, I guess tell me what are some of your favorite and least favorite memories of the church? Like bad experiences, good experiences, being over at I mean, some of the good experiences where the church would put on some cool events, like they'd rent out a roller rink and stuff, you know, roller skating events. There's stuff like that. Those are some of the cool church experiences, just grouped events. I don't know how much you know about that. They'll rent like a local they they do it usually like at least once a year. They just rent out a roller skating rink and the whole place is theirs and they just have a church roller skating night. Activities like that, just for church camping trips, barbecues, just events, you know, or just they have the church picnic annually. They've been doing that since the beginning. I just they just go to a park and have a big picnic, which is free food and just people play football or volleyball and just have fun, stuff like that. And what about any kind of any bad experiences in particular stand out? At the church, I mean, besides just dealing with their moronic church members, not particularly. The group chat was bad, but I mean, not really, because I it'd be the most of the people condemning. I didn't care what they thought, so it didn't really hurt me deeply. I wasn't deeply offended or anything. Was there ever any talk like, "Oh, you need to, you need to repent, you need to get right with God," and you know? Oh, absolutely. There was all about that. Are you even? I, I don't think my parents have ever accusing us of not even being Christians because we said the N word on a group chat. Oh dear! It was just like it's like wow, you got teenage boys on a group chat and they said a bunch of stupid crap. Is anybody really surprised? Like that's not a unique thing. They're acting like we're the first teenagers to ever say bad things on a group chat. So no, there was definitely a lot of uh, that we needed to cleanse whatever sin they they kept trying to. They were really interested in figuring out what wickedness we got into that it influenced us to say these horrible things. When in fact there was none, we just came up with it on our own because we were teenagers and stupid. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get influenced. We just did it, but they were very interested in finding out what had influenced us to do such wicked things. Would you so, say yeah. that your that Stephen Anderson was a good father to you? Oh. Ooh, that's a tough one because I don't know. I haven't had any other fathers, um, and I mean, considering me and my brothers, the oldest the oldest three are the only ones that are adults right now. We have all we were all doing great. We all have our own places. We all have good jobs, making good money. We're educated. Like we're doing great. So I mean, I guess I can't say it was all bad because I great. I think like 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 how bad can I really say it was? I definitely think he did a lot of very messed up and wrong things. But in the sum total of things, if me and my older brother and younger brother are doing great so far, how bad could he possibly be? I guess I don't know. Who knows what I maybe I would have been way better without him or way worse. I I couldn't tell you. I, I have no idea. You don't have anything else to really compare it to. Yeah. Exactly. Because I've only had one father. And since me and my brothers, none of us are homeless drug addicts or something. We're doing great. We all have good jobs and we're, we're doing fine. The oldest two are now married. Don't know if, I don't know if John's getting married anytime soon or what John's thing is, but John's doing great. So all of us are doing properly. Um, so, yeah, it's not like he was a total failure. Clearly not. If his first three children are all productive members of society. And then I guess it remains to be seen how the uh, other nine turn out. But well, and you we'll you mentioned that there were some messed up things you went through. Are there any of those that you'd want to talk about? I mean, just excessive physical punishment, more so. For example, the group chat when he said he beat us, uh, he definitely was not exaggerating. Um, the good news is, I don't know if you remember, my father's not a very large man. He's about hundred and sixty pounds, so he definitely it wasn't for lack of trying. He didn't. I didn't get injured or anything. So basically what happened was I was sitting at the kitchen counter on like a wooden bar stool basically. And when he heard about this, I was sitting at the counter. He walked in through like the front door. I didn't hear him come in. You know, there's a bunch of kids, kids coming in. He basically like ripped my chair backwards. So to crash, like the chair shattered. It was like, it was like a WWE style entrance basically. He made his entrance and just started kicking and stomping me into the floor. He said he was going to kill me at the time. Um, he kept trying to provoke me to fight him because I think he was, it was only me and him there. Like no one, none of the kids were around for some reason. I forget where they were. They were at the park or something. No one was around. 
in hindsight, I believe he was trying to provoke me into like, say, bloodying his nose so that he could, if he sent me to the hospital or kill me, he could claim self-defense. So, which obviously I do jujitsu and kickboxing. I would break him in half if I ever fought him. I didn't care though, because he, as I said, he's not very big. Despite him stomping and kicking and trying to slam me into the tile and concrete floor, he couldn't cut me, couldn't do anything because he doesn't, he's not that big or that strong. I can bench press more than he can squat. So he's, uh, it, it, there wasn't really much he could do to actually like seriously injure me or hurt me. But it wasn't for lack of trying. He absolutely tried. He, he failed, but he absolutely tried to beat me senseless. Absolutely. Were there other points in your childhood where you had done stuff like that? Uh, absolutely. So Solomon, if he gets a fresh haircut, he's inside his head. Like, I forget which side it is, but on the side of his head, he has a, about an inch long scar on the side of his head. That was because one of his bum ass church members reported Solomon for watching YouTube, um, snitched on him. Basically, I think it was their deacon just said, Oh, you know, your son's watching YouTube or something. And there we lived in an old house time built in the fifties. So it had these like, you know, those stone windowsills where it's like pure concrete And Solomon had his head grabbed and his head was like smashed like a melon over it. And it split him to where you could see his exposed skull underneath the bone, like underneath the skin. It split him to the bone and he's permanently scarred on the side of his head. It's underneath his hair. So you don't, you can't see it all the time, but he has a scar because Corbin Russell snitched on him for YouTube and he got his head smashed over a windowsill, like a concrete windowsill. There was absolutely stuff like that. We also used to get beaten with an electrical cord, which it's hard to describe how bad that is because it's really light and whippy but it has like you know a uh, copper co- core or whatever and that would basically leave you bloody like you'd get beaten bloody with one of those he absolutely lives up to his preaching when it comes to beer goods i struggle just to prove that i think that's excessive it's barbaric it's inhumane but that absolutely happens and, and that yeah. was that wasn't just for the boys but the the girls as well the girls got beat pretty bad, never with like the electrical cord because you can't beat girls bloody because uh, they're not boys. They are not going to do as well. The girls, their preferred method instead of beating them, which leaves bruises and marks. I don't know if you know this. Women bruise a lot easier than men due to even a skinny woman versus a skinny guy. The body fat percentage is much different. So women carry more body fat on their arms and legs, even if they're skinny. So because of that, that tissue bruises a lot easier. Whereas like a guy with a muscle on his arm, it does not bruise so easily. It doesn't damage as easily. So you can beat them a lot harder and knock it. Like so I see my wife. I barely even bumped my wife's leg by accident. She has some purple bruise for like a week. It's ridiculous. Whereas me, I'll go to Muay Thai and just get the crap kicked out of my legs. And I'm completely fine. Like there's no bruising because there's no the, – the fat bruises a lot easier than muscle. But the girls, their preferred method – I, I don't think they do this anymore – but they just rinsed them down with really, really cold water. Um, which uh, my grandfather was visiting from Germany, and then he saw my mom spanking the girls, and he flipped out like, "Oh, that's barbaric! It's inhumane! You can't beat them." My mom's like, "What should I do?" He's just like, "Hose them down with cold water. It works perfectly." And my mom tried it, and to be fair, it did work. And it's less—I'd say it's more humane than beating someone because it doesn't physically damage you. It's cold water. Little kids don't like it, but like. If someone asked me, would you rather get beat bloody or hosed down with some cold water? Sure, hose me down. It's cold. Whatever. It doesn't. It doesn't physically damage you. So that was. Those were their preferred methods. And I guess uh, you know, talking about like the incident with Solomon. Were you there? Did you see that happen? Uh, yeah, I don't. I believe so. Kind of. I think I was around, but I wasn't in the house. Like I was in the other room when he got his head smashed, but I did see him bleeding all over the place because he was not given any medical care whatsoever. He was not taken to the doctor for that. So I remember seeing him outside because then they promptly made him go like do yard work in the heat or something. He had like blood running down the side of his head and like his whole shirt was covered in blood. He was because obviously you've seen someone gets their head split, it bleeds pretty badly. So yeah, he was he was bleeding all over the place from that. Um, I don't think I saw him get his head smashed though, no. But I I, I, I heard about it like he told me. And did your did like from from that or from any other incidents like where people were beaten bloody? Did your father ever, you know, console them later or show remorse over it? Absolutely not. Not only did he not ever show remorse, I'm pretty sure he doesn't even remember. Like I bet if someone asked him about this, he's going to completely deny and go, "I never did that." He has no memory of this because to him it wasn't as big of a deal, obviously. So he probably he would probably truthfully say that never happened because he truthfully does not remember smashing Solomon's head over a concrete window sill for watching YouTube. Um, he probably has no recollection. Just another day at the office for him. Uh, but obviously Solomon w- would remember. I mean, his the side of his head's permanently scarred from that. Jeez, I am I am sorry you had to uh, go through that as a kid. I mean, it definitely sucks, but it does build character. It doesn't make them great, but I mean, it's in the long run, it probably builds character. 
probably right. Suffering of any kind usually makes you a better person. So, well, well, I would never do that to my children. It happened to me and I turned out fine. So I, I wouldn't do that because it's barbaric and inhumane and just, it's just awful, but yeah, I'm doing great. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not terribly sorry for myself. Are you aware of any of the other pastors like taking these kind of uh, approaches to, to corporal punishment? To my knowledge, none of them are as draconian about it as my father was. They all do it, but to my knowledge, it's not that bad. No, I think my dad, at least to my knowledge, is an anomaly in, in how far he took it. Who knows, though? They, the others might be as well. I have no clue, honestly. I, I don't want to say none of them do, and they are. Because then again, though, I bet none of these other pastors knew my dad was doing it that bad. So, yeah, because obviously something that happened at home, this wasn't a public thing. They never did this stuff in public or talked about it or acknowledged it. And you were saying they, they never, like, sought medical care or anything for that kind of thing? No, no, never. Never that I'm aware of. I mean, we did go to the doctor if we broke bones. Um, Growing up, none of us ever broke bones because we drank our milk. After me and Saul moved out, though, you know, if kids break bones, so they definitely go to the doctor. It was more of just if they beat us so bad that we were bleeding because we weren't bleeding out, okay? It was more just like you're beaten and the skin breaks open and you're bleeding. Because if you cut the side of your head, it's bad, but you're, you're at very little risk of dying from that despite how bad it might look. Because your body, I mean, none of us are anemic, so it just it clots up, and you'll be okay in a week or two. Are you afraid at all of your father, you know, seeing this or, or hearing about this? As I stated, I can bench press more than he can squat. I'd like, I don't think I have any reason to be afraid of him. Uh, I'm sure he's not going to be happy about this. Absolutely not. Um, I mean, but then again, though, if what he did was so right, he should have no problem saying I absolutely this because everything I'm saying is not exaggerated and it's 100% factual. So because of that, he then has a choice. He can either say that was wrong, made a mistake, sorry, or he can go and go, no, I don't regret anything. Fair. Either way, as since I'm completely telling the truth, I don't think there's any reason why he should not want this to be out there. Because if it's true and he did it and he was completely justified, then why would he be worried if people know what he did? So... And how did your mom, I guess, react to, to these kind of punishments? Oh, she was completely on board with it. Absolutely. She never did it as bad as him because as a woman, she physically can't beat somebody as hard as my father can. But it was she wasn't exactly encouraging him to stop either. So no, she was she was completely on board with it, at least to my knowledge. Do you have any, I guess, memories growing up of you know your father being very loving or supportive? Um uh... I don't know about loving and supportive. I mean, we definitely had some fun times with him because when he's not losing his shit, he's actually he, – he can be a pretty chill guy to hang with if, if he's not angry and flipping out. Like because he's a, he's a surprisingly normal guy when he's not going ape shit. He's surprisingly normal. So um, it's hard to say, I guess. He was probably – yeah, he was – like we definitely have plenty of happy memories with him. But just woe to anyone who's in the house if he was angry basically. Which is strange because he never drank or did drugs or anything. So it'd be weird. Like, I don't know why he'd be randomly snapping sometimes. It wasn't like he'd get drunk and go nuts. He never drank or consumed any drugs when I lived with him. So, like, I don't, yeah, but he, you know, just stuff happened. He would just lose his shit and everyone's, and everyone better watch out. Like, just if, if everybody was hanging, even if there wasn't any big controversy or somebody hadn't, you know, done something they weren't supposed to do. I think it was because circling back, we had like 12 people. Uh, possibly even 13. I don't remember if they had 11 kids that are 12 living in a three bedroom home. Yeah, that, that, that's going to cause problems. Tensions are going to run high because everyone's living on top of each other. When you have 13 people and two small bathrooms to use, there's going to be some issues because of that. So tensions are going to run high. From what I understand, he does, he's not really like that anymore because they have a much larger home now. So he can, because he'd be basically working on his computer in peace and the kids, they're little kids, they're stupid, they're running around raising hell. And then he would eventually, you know, have enough of that and get and get pretty angry. But did you now ever, he's got like his own work office downstairs. I guess kind of looking at that living situation, even as a kid, because yeah. that is something that is very encouraged, at least in a lot of the sermons I've seen from the church, to have as many kids as possible. The woman stays home, the father goes out and works, which can put like for for raising up, especially in the last you know decades, as prices have. Uh, inflamed housing prices are nuts, man. Yeah, they're crazy housing, uh, cost of living, just general expenses like that has to be a a hard kind of life to to keep living. It's not like back in the fifties and sixties. No, I that... mean it to my yeah to my father's credit, to my knowledge, 
We, we have we never received a penny from the government, no food stamps, nothing. We never received housing assistance, food stamps. And to my knowledge, he always paid every bill on time every month. And we, and we never went hungry. So to his credit there, he did have a bunch of kids. Aside from the house being way too small, they, they took care of us about as well as they could. Like we always had food and we ate organic and stuff too. So we weren't even just eating like ramen noodles. So we had – we had relatively good food and we had our clothes and shoes. We just didn't really have anything fancy or anything, but like everybody was taken care of. We took no government assistance and he paid all his bills on time every month to his credit. And are you so, really particularly close with any of your siblings? Yeah. Yeah. Very close with, with my brothers, all of them and, and, and my sisters too. I hang out with them regularly, mm-hmm. but no, I, I hang out with all of them pretty routinely. All right, well, At I least think- every few weeks. Yeah. That uh, unless there's you know anything else you'd like to say about you know your dad or uh, the the congregation um, or the church, not really. I mean, his congregation freaking sucks. They're mostly just like weirdos. Like they're way more judgmental than even my parents are. Like they're way more straight laced and hardcore. And I don't want to say straight laced because that's like usually a good thing. They're just like idiots. They just basically they're like take this weird hyper traditionalism too far to like a point of stupidity. And I'm not a fan of like. So it makes, it makes it makes the rest of us normal ones look kind of stupid because if I mention being associated with them, people might assume I'm some like complete weirdo like they are. And I'm really not like I live a pretty normal life. Like I'm not ranting on the internet every day about homosexuals or something. <laughs> it's not whereas they are. I like they they they, they, they kind of hyper inflate things that aren't really the big. And obviously, if you're a Christian, I mean, the Bible does condemn that stuff, obviously. But that's not a big issue for us, so we shouldn't really need to be, you know, screaming and yelling about it every single day. Do you think your dad's uh, like yeah. more inflammatory rhetoric will like has drawn those kind of people in? Yes, yes, because obviously, I think if my dad had a much more chill approach, he'd get more chill members. But because he is so, I don't want to say up. In- um, I'm sorry, I'm losing it here. Um, he's so like staunch on it, and like has such like aggressive language with with his that wraps like delits to his cause, and yeah, and that tension, but that's how it happens. Yes, uh, I think that about does yeah. it for me. Unless, yeah, I think I've got most of everything. Uh, with your dad and your mom and your siblings. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to say? I mean, not really. No. Um, I mean, I was just here to answer questions really. So I don't, I don't need like a soapbox to say something I to get off my chest. I was just answering questions really. Well, I definitely appreciate it. It is a, like I was, I was telling you and we had talked uh, before. It's not a, every day that people get a look into kind of what it's like growing up in a church like this and especially what it's like growing up under a, uh, under yeah. someone like Steven. Oh, and for the record, I, I might add this, despite all the awful stuff mentioned, I, I had a, I wouldn't say I had an unhappy childhood. I thought these were pretty regular things like day to day. I was a mostly happy guy still am, but uh, obviously in hindsight, messed up. But at the time I, like, I wasn't like, I guess I wouldn't say I wasn't really suffering. I thought it was normal. So I just I just adjusted. So see in hindsight it sounds a lot worse, but at, at the time it didn't seem so bad. Not really, at least. Well, Isaac, thank you very much for uh making time and sorry for impeding on your hike. <laughs> no worries. You're good. Well, uh, I I'll probably finish it. it after this or something. Yeah. Yep. And there, our conversation ended. Even for those I vehemently disagree with, I have always believed in meeting somebody where they're at, and that, by necessity, needs to include understanding their lived experiences. As an outside observer, my chat with Isaac confirmed many suspicions I had about Steven Anderson and the NIFB Church. It's not hard to see from Anderson's sermons that he is a very angry man, prone to outbursts and slurs even from the pulpit. And knowing that anger extended even to his children and family is personally heartbreaking for me. Steven Anderson seems to be an impetuous little man desperate to control everything around him, even to the point of violence, when he knows he won't be met with any pushback. 
Isaac attests that he still looks back fondly on parts of his childhood and his upbringing. He's still in contact with his parents. Yet, I don't think he'd disagree that his upbringing has affected him in ways he might not even be aware of yet. And this is where I want to give a more personal, less neutral take and say that while Isaac may have not known anything else, so his upbringing wasn't out of the ordinary for him, I fully believe that no child should have to go through the things he described at any age. What Steven Anderson has done to his children is beyond reprehensible. And I think the damage he's done to his kids is going to vary from kid to kid. I don't know what goodness there is to Steven Anderson, but I can't see much in anyone who would treat their own children that way. I don't want my audience to shower Isaac with pity because, by his own account, he is living a happy, productive life. Isaac doesn't want pity, and the beliefs that he's come to as an adult have been of his own volition. Yet I don't think it's easy to cast him as an irredeemable Nazi because of his upbringing. From my brief time with him, Isaac Anderson seems to be a hardworking, well-spoken man. He doesn't at all resemble the hateful spewing of preachers like Aaron Thompson who would outright refuse to speak with somebody like me. But he's also a self-proclaimed Nazi. I ran this script by him, so he has approved everything here. Isaac had what sounds like a hellish upbringing with a temperamental and possibly distant father. A father who is one of the most notorious hate preachers in the world, who is openly anti-Semitic and spreads violent rhetoric against LGBTQ people. I can't say for certain how much that upbringing contributed to his current beliefs, but I can speculate. If there's one thing I'd like people to walk away from this video with, it's that people are complicated. I believe that we are made of parts of one another and our experiences, and that life is an ever-changing journey. And I hope that, like anyone on that journey, Isaac is able to grow and change. Because it seems like his father never will. And nobody deserves to live in the shadow of a man like Steven Anderson. Anyone can be better, and I hope that of Isaac too. Steven Anderson's caustic influence doesn't extend to merely those in his orbit, but everyone who seeks out his violent and inflammatory rhetoric. As he continues preaching, I grow more worried about people who will hear his tirades and see them as excuses to be violent against LGBTQ people or other faiths. But Anderson's issues spread further than just his preaching. Not even his own offspring were safe from his violent outbursts. Not even his own kids, who should be able to trust their parents, who seek refuge and guidance from parents, were exempt. There is no loving God I know that would justify such treatment of children. And if Steven Anderson ever comes to meet his creator, is my personal opinion but I doubt he will be shown mercy. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for watching. This is obviously something a little bit different than my regular output. However, I've been in contact with Isaac for a couple months now, and we've been going back and forth on the details of what this interview might be. For those wondering about my video on the history of anti-Semitism, it is still coming. I am covering more than 2,000 years of history in that video, and have run it by about four different editors, and I have an upcoming interview scheduled with a Holocaust scholar who works out of San Francisco. Uh, so I'm hoping to start editing that massive work together in the coming weeks. I don't foresee myself doing more interviews like this in the future, uh, whether with Isaac or anybody else. However, when the opportunity presented itself to shine some light on the inner workings of the NIFB, given how much now history I guess I have with the church, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So many of the things that we've covered and seen come out of the NIFB churches that we've done videos on on this channel, I feel speak for themselves with very little need for commentary between them, even though I've given them. And I feel maybe more than anything, this interview stands on its own as a testament to what life is like under people who believe as fervently as Steven Anderson does. All of that being said, this is my last intended look at the NIFB for a while, uh, as I have several other large projects in the works. So if you enjoy particularly my journalism, please check out my Patreon and additional links down below because I have a absolutely massive undercover project brewing that I cannot talk about yet. But if you enjoyed my look at the NIFB church, I'm sure you will enjoy and find valuable 
my upcoming work. To that end, thank you very, very much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.